Hi, everybody. Ann Trufant and Michaelin McGinnis, who is our guest today. Welcome to Kingdom Conversations. Michaelin is up visiting us at camp, and she's a youth minister in Baton Rouge and loves kids. She was the nanny for one, for one of my grandsons, <laughs> and uh, so we go back a ways. I love this girl, love what she does, love her passion for the Lord. And one of the things that, um, of course, we've just closed a camp season, and so sending kids home into their worlds is very big on my heart right now. And so Michael and I have just been talking, and I thought it would be good to bring you guys into the conversation. So many of you are parents. So many of you are wanting to know, how do I reach my kids? How do I protect them from society? But more than that, how do I equip them <clears throat> to stand in the society that we have and, and to grow as Christians, and not just Christians, but Christian leaders? So I had a phone call this morning from a, a good friend who is having some struggles with a teenager and wanted to know a way to go about it. And I want to say uh, there is such great hope and goodness in this generation. Gen Zs, oh my goodness, they are amazing. And when you get them, they are pit bulls and for everything good. And part of the reason is that God knows what he's doing and he's equipped these kids to be a powerhouse for the season that we're in, for the times that we live in. The thing is, what do they need? What are they looking for? How do you reach them? We wanna give you tools. So Michael, go for it. Man, so praying this semester and last semester, one of the scripture passages that was really coming to my heart that our kids have been praying with is Sirach 2.10. Has anyone ever hoped in the Lord and been disappointed? Has anyone ever persevered in his word and been left unaided? And when I brought that to them, first of all, they were like, we have Sirach, where is that in the Bible? And once we <laughs> went through all of that, um, they really want a reason to hope. Yeah. They want to trust in the word, but sometimes the, the commitment to doing that is just not there. They want to do it, but after the mountaintop experience, they struggle with getting back into it. So I just took my kids to a Steubenville conference. And while they were giving testimonies after adoration, we took 41 and 37 of them gave a testimony about how their life, prayer, or hope was impacted after adoration. And I took notes while they were saying everything because my kid's favorite thing to do is to have a profound experience. And then next Tuesday, come back and be like, I've never heard the Lord say anything. <laughs> I'm like, that's crazy because on page 200 of my journal, I have heard the Lord say this for the first time, heard the Lord at all for the first time, or really felt hope for the first time. They're like, oh, and now our kids have started calling each other out on that and holding each other accountable. And that's the game changer. Okay, but wait, 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 wait. <laughs> so you're talking about a youth group on fire, right? Mm -hmm. And they're normal kids and they're in process, but they're on fire. So what happens when your kids are nowhere? They've got none of that. Mm -hmm. How did you get them oh, yeah. to this place? So when I started working at the parish that I'm at now, we had about eight to 12 kids and it took probably six months to get them to evangelize to any of anyone of their friends, even though most of them went to a Catholic school. I find... Um, in Baton Rouge, some of the hardest places to be Catholic are oh. Catholic schools. And how did you get them to evangelize? What does that mean? We're talking to folks who, who yeah. are going, tell me more, tell me more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for a lot of them, it was stepping out in holy boldness and not being afraid of rejection and going up to someone that's brought up in prayer, a memory that they had with someone that they're like, why is that person coming up in prayer? And then going to that person and simply asking if they wanted to join. My kid's catchphrase for uh, our weekly Bible study is come for the food, stay for the Jesus. And sometimes the kids just come for the food and then they learn something that they didn't realize that they wanted. Isn't that the key? Yeah. And it was beautiful. We had eight to 12 when we first started, which I think was a little prophetic with the 12 of them that were very hard headed, very Peter like. And then when they started evangelizing, I mean, we've got over a hundred in active ministry now just in high school and that come from different parishes because they see what our kids have mm -hmm. and they want it. And even if our kids can't articulate it, they know that they've encountered something and they keep coming to learn scripture. They keep coming to learn the Lord's voice is really what we've been working on. Mm -hmm. How do you know it's my voice instead of, or how do you know it's the Lord's voice instead of my voice or the enemy and trying to parse out what that actually sounds like so that you can actually discern instead of just decide things. So I bet people listening right this minute would love to hear, how do you do that? Yeah. Give them some tools about yeah. how do you discern? Absolutely. Every time we pray and I ask um, the Lord 
to give them words or to give them scripture or to give them a person to pray for. Um, and they're trying to figure out how is it the Lord in their mind. We say that if something pops up into your mind, you run with it unless it does not bring peace. And sometimes the Lord can bring something that induces kind of like a holy nervousness of, are you actually calling me to do that? You really want me to talk to that person? We haven't talked since the third grade, or whatever that is. Um, and so we say to just push it out of the mind. And if it keeps coming back with peace, then you follow it. And if it comes back with an anxiety or a spirit of fear, we can trust that that is not the Lord. And so we just keep following where there is peace. And even if you're in prayer and the Lord is bringing up a hamburger and you're like, why is he bringing up a hamburger? And maybe for one of our kids, it was, um, he wanted him to go bring a friend to curbside burgers. And they talked about scripture and he's like, but all my, in my head was just a hamburger. And I'm like, yeah. And the Lord speaks in crazy ways. And you're male and you're 15. And of course, yes, your of course. It's a hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's their, their accountability with one another has been so helpful. I don't even have to break out the journal as much anymore to remind them of when the Lord has spoken to them because they'll say every week at our Thursday high school Bible study, they'll say, um, yeah, I've, I've never heard the Lord or, or I've never gotten anything from this passage. And then some of them will pipe up in the back and say, remember last year? When you said this, or right. remember in January when you said you had a vision of the Lord following the monstrance, you really think you haven't heard the Lord? And they're like, oh. So there's just like this yeah. radical amnesia, I think, with Gen Z that forgets the encounter because I do think they're trying to be present and they just kind of forget what has happened. And the other thing is, I think um, often we do a disservice when we go from one mountaintop experience to mm -hmm. another. This is really a disservice. This is not teaching anybody to walk the walk of faith, whether you feel anything or not. Mm -hmm. And so, although it's amazing to go to a Steubenville conference or, you know, any conference and to have an encounter with the Lord or just love the worship or love the fellowship or whatever, or love somebody's word to you when they pray mm -hmm. for you, um, then this, one of the things that I see is a real struggle with this particular generation is then going back and actually walking out the hard mm -hmm. work of discipline yep. and growing a prayer life. You know, it's like whether I feel like it or not, I'm going to pray for 10 minutes today or I'm going to read scripture for 10 minutes today. I'm going to do this whether mm -hmm. I feel like it or not. That's hard for this generation. But once you get them, mm. once you get them, what's your experience? Yeah, I also think it's bringing what they've experienced at these mountaintops into what's happening in the home. And we just did this the other day. We were doing worship at the end of Bible study. And a lot of our kids who had just been to Steubenville and were on fire, and we were singing one of the songs from Steubenville. We're singing Rest On Us. And some of the kids were singing, and the rest of them were just kind of sitting like this. And I exploded nicely and was like, remember when we were at Steubenville and you were all raising your hands in joy tear-filled eyes because the Lord was there and all of your friends were praising together. Remember that moment? That moment is happening right now. Like the same Jesus that was there is the same Jesus that is here with us right now. And the same Holy Spirit that was with us in that room is here in this room, even though we're not in an arena in Missouri, like is in our dilapidated right. youth house. Like it is in this space and it's in that prayer life. And getting them to commit to prayer, I think it's the hardest because even if we're not just stringing together the March for Life to the Steubenville to the mission trip, a lot of my kids, even now, and I think one of their biggest struggle for the ones before they committed to prayer was that every youth night was a mountaintop experience. And their faith was, I go to church and I go to youth group and that's where I live my faith. And then sometimes I have this double life elsewhere. Right. Or... I just turn off faith when I walk out of the youth house doors. And, you know, our ministry is beautiful because on busy weeks, we have ministry available six days a week. And so for a lot of them, they're like, I'm putting in the hours. I'm here five times a week. So what else is there? And then they are upset because they feel like they can't hear the Lord. I'm like, well, are you reading scripture? Because how are you going to hear and know his voice if you're not diving into that? So our kids this year, the Lord put it on my heart to do um, a little August scripture challenge. And so it was completely optional, put it in the group. And we have a faithful bunch that some of them, I, I made the, the question in the group me, how many minutes a day are you praying with scripture? Be honest. And most of them were at zero and they want to pray with scripture and they want to hear the Lord's voice. And so every day in August so far, it's been a brief scripture verse 
or passage that the Lord's putting on my heart. Sometimes it's one of the daily readings and then a couple reflection questions. And they have been asking questions about what's happening. And because they're reading different translations, they'll say, well, my footnote says this. Well, I had a question about the Canaanite woman and why Jesus was calling her a dog. What the heck is happening there? And they're answering each other's questions. And as a youth minister, it it's the most better. beautiful yeah. thing to watch them and me start typing a response and then one of them send one and me just backspace and go, yep, yes. And I'm just there to correct heresy. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think, I think for those of us who are parents, um, the challenge is not to send your kid to youth group so you can sit at home and not have any changes in your life. Like mm -hmm. they're looking at you to see what life looks like for you. Where, are you peaceful? Are you praying? Um, are you looking at scripture as God's promises and praying those into your circumstances? Like, where's your faith? And guys, I, I think for all of us, we have to get really on our faces and honest with this about our day-to-day -day witness to our mm -hmm. kids. And what the enemy would like to do is push you and and confront you harshly and condemn you and say, you're terrible. You're not doing any of this. And you probably never will. You're such a slug, you know, but what God's voice will always do is say, Hey, let's do it together. Mm. In the passion translation of song of songs, chapter two, um, the, the, uh, bridegroom is talking. It's Jesus talking to each one of us about the little foxes that are stealing mm -hmm. the things he's planting in the vineyard. And he says, can you take care of those little foxes? And then he goes, never mind. We'll do it together. Mm -hmm. When the Lord speaks, it's always going to be, hey, Michael and hey, Ann, let me do this with you. Let's mm -hmm. walk this out and do it differently. There's such a joy mm -hmm. in one returning. So if you have been struggling, to pray regularly, or if you just don't feel like it, or you don't know how, or what do I pick up? You know, never in the history of the planet have we had so many resources, and sometimes that's overwhelming, mm -hmm. that it's so, so, so different. But go talk to somebody. Talk to somebody who's one step ahead of you in the faith journey, and say, how do you pray? What do you do? Go to the missiononthemountain.com Look at the resources. There are so many retreats, talks, 10-minute little teachings on Scripture that can be a help for you. What if you just listened to one of the ballistic breakthroughs, 10 minutes, one a day, to start, to kickstart your prayer and say, wow, I've never even thought like that before. Yeah. But find somebody who's one step ahead of you and say, help me put something in place because I want this too. So you had told mm -hmm. me before, my kids want living water. They don't know how to get there. You know, they want to be on fire. They don't know how to sustain that. They want, they want, but they don't know how. Isn't that all of us? You know, and what works in one season, I remember I used to be sailing through a prayer life that was working, mm -hmm. working, working, and then I'd have another baby and everything was <laughs> out the window and you have to start all over and you feel so disconnected and so discombobulated. It's like the Lord's saying, hey, Everything that you've poured in, everything that you've sowed in, every act of love that you've lived, mm. you know, all of this, you're going to just start, you're going to have to live from overflow for just a minute while you get yourself back on track in a new mm -hmm. season. But don't worry about it. Just make a decision that you too want living water. You too want to be on fire. You too want to learn how to pray in a way that sustains. Learn how to pray scripture, which is not only nice words. Scripture is full of over 7,000 of God's oaths to each one of us. It's not just to Moses and Abraham, to each one of us. And the question always is not, do we believe in God? Everybody watching this would raise their hand and say, <laughs> yes. But the question is, do we believe him? You know, do we believe that these promises were not just for people 2,000 years ago? Are they for me now? Mm. Sometimes we have to radically change the way we think. So we'll change the way we see, right? Yes. I, I'm constantly telling my kids that, that. Sometimes I think they think miracles are a thing of the past. Exactly. And I'm like, our God is a miracle working God. He's working right now. And I do think that some of their struggle is that they want to evangelize to their parents because they want their family to be a family that prays, but they're afraid that they don't have it together enough, who does, to be able to bring their parents into it. Right. And then for some of them, 
youth group Bible study is a safe space that they don't have to bring to their parents. It's like the one space that gets to be just theirs. But then they get into a season of track and then now they're not at Bible study because they have track practice every day. And so the way to sustain it really is the family. There's a study that I read um, that was talking about, you know, Catholics and 68% of them believe that the Eucharist is a symbol, Mm -hmm. which is crazy town out of over 40,000 different Christian denominations that we're the one that believe in true presence. And yet two thirds of our group is like, ah, no, just kidding. Um, And they were talking about how, you know, the average age of disaffiliation for the faith is 11 and one in three have left the church before the age of 24. And it said that parents, if mom is the, the head of house for religion and the faith goer and the faith initiator and the initiator of prayer and going to mass, that the retention rate is about 12% for kids, at, wow. not including the disaffiliation or the one in three that leave by 24. It's 12%. And they said, and if dad, and, and this is hard, I have a lot of kids in my group that have broken families and separated households. And so for a lot of them, they hear this next statistic and go, then what do I do? And maybe a fatherless household or in a household where dad's not the faith initiator. But the study said that if dad is the faith initiator, the initiator of mass, praying, especially the ironic blessing over his kids, you know, anointing, parents have the spiritual authority to bless their kids, which is the same spiritual authority that when priests bless things, it holds that authority. And so the ironic blessing, my dad never let me leave the house without, you know, right. tracing the cross on Mine my head. Didn't either. But it says that the the rate of retention almost quadruples and it's like 86%. This is amazing. That's crazy. Yeah. And, and for a lot of them, I think, you know, in the father's households, that's why God is hard because God, the father seems unattainable and the Holy Spirit seems flighty. And so they're only trying to connect with Jesus, which is great. But when they're not opening themselves up to the full Trinitarian experience, they're like losing parts of the goodness and the joy and the way that the spirit is trying to prompt them. And that's really what we've been working on. And it's been incredible that when the spirit prompts you, and you're like, I don't want to do that. And you push it out of your head and it keeps coming back that the spirit is being persistent for a time such as this, for you to be bold and courageous and do whatever it is. And for a lot of them right now, it's their parents. So my friends, just want to encourage you, listen carefully to this. You may want to listen to this a couple of times. <laughs> Because I think the Lord's calling us like we are in a, an age that is crazy. We're looking at war and the threat of war and and just such meanness and division and destruction and distraction and phones and all this kind of stuff. And it seems to some like I'm just little old me and I, I can't do this and all that. Well, here's the deal. The Lord looked at Jeremiah when he was young and Jeremiah goes, I can't do this. I'm just young. And he goes, don't tell me what you can't do because you're going to go where I send you. You're going to speak the words and I'm going to put it in you. And that is for each one of us. I don't care if you're 10 or 100. Right this minute, we are called to live like Esther for such a time as this. And therefore, the Lord can equip us. He can equip the ones he's called. And that's each one of us. And all we have to do is say, yes, yes, Mm. I want more. Lord, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to get there yet. But yes, and then begin to listen. Ask him very specific questions and expect him to answer. Because any one of you who are a good parent can absolutely make yourself clear to your children if you want them (laughs) to know something, right? Right. So how much more, God, to be able to say to you, hey, move this way, do this, do this, do this. It's kind of like my nine-year-old grandson trying to teach me to play chess the other night. And I'm looking at all these people and this one can go in an L and that one can go diagonal. I didn't know what he was talking about. But, and that's sometimes how life looks, how faith looks, how prayer looks. But here's the deal. The Lord says, just say yes and give me the control of your life and let me move you on that board exactly the way I want. And you will always have checkmate. You'll always Mm. have checkmate as will your family, as will your children. Don't ever, 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 ever give up. And this Gen Z generation, when we get them hooked and it's a process, right? Yes, absolutely. it's a process that goes on and on and on. But when they get it, they get it with such Mm. fire and tenacity that it is going to rock our world. So thank you, my friend. What you're doing is amazing. We love it. We love you. We bless you. And let's just ask the Lord's blessing for all of these folks. Mm -hmm. Jesus, we say yes. I want you to be saying that. We say yes. And we give you everything we are. 
And right this minute, Lord, do something new. We give you permission. Do mm -hmm. something new in us. Give us a hunger for your word. Give us a hunger for prayer. Give us a hunger for a deep friendship with you. Some, some of us may not even know that's possible, but it is. So let your grace fall. Let your Holy Spirit fall on all of us. And let us be the ones who rise up as the generation who blesses and praises you in good season and in bad to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. We give you all the glory and the honor forever and ever. Amen. Amen.